Well, it's an idyllic day, a wonderful setting. Behind me is the curiously green-blue sea breaking on the yellow sands, and in front of me is the Tates and Dives, which, although I'm not a great architectural buff or anything, strikes me as the most happy building in the surroundings. It's a mixture of uh, curves and straight lines. Of course, most architecture is, but very curvy curves and very straight, straight lines. And it's white, but it uses here and there to point out the details, local stone, little triangle of grass in front of it. The main feature is this uh, dome-like uh, structure in the middle, complete circle, which reflects the fact that it was originally a gasworks here, and it's taken up some of the shape of the gasworks. Altogether, it's, well, I think it's extremely beautiful, and it looks as though it was meant for here, and uh, it will stand here for a long time becoming uh, very, very accustomed to its setting and place. Crossing the road, a certain amount of aluminium. It doesn't, uh, the rails are, the handrails, it doesn't uh, shirk the fact it's a modern structure. There's nothing old world about it, old e world as people tend to call it. And uh, a certain amount of glass and these uh, steps leading up to it. No, it's it's really a happy piece of architecture. It's uh, absolutely built for its function. And when things are built for function, they usually work. It's got a, a great deal of glass. It could be plexiglass, I suppose, I don't know. Inside this dome surrounding it, you can probably hear the echo as I go underneath it. And now we're approaching the, the door. And uh, we're going to have a look at the paintings in situ, all of which by artists associated with uh, with this town. And now we're going in through the door and there's a lady with a very amusing hairdo waiting to greet us. Uh, how, how do you do? Hello, I'm Ina Cole. I'm an information officer here at the Tate Gallery St. Ives. Good. I'm just looking at you first. Take you in as a work of art in itself and then we can move on okay. into the building. What I like about the uh, the gallery up to date is you're not frightened of space. You like to use space, nothing's crammed together or jostled together. Yes, absolutely. I think the architects, when they actually um, designed the building, they, they wanted the building to be very much an exploration of space. So I think when you're walking through, the way they've used the space and the way that the space and the paintings actually interact is, is very, very important and works particularly well. I mean, it, it certainly seems to me here we have an enormous uh, piece of stained glass by Patrick Heron, I suppose, isn't it? Yes, it is, yeah. Yes, it's, it's wonderful. The interesting thing is it casts a sort of violet glow onto the pebble glass wall behind Yes, it, yes, it does. It's a sort of combination of the actual colours he's used there. It does, does create this um, violet haze, really, and it's, um, it changes all the time depending on the weather conditions outside. Mm. Yes, and it's, uh, it's abstract, as most of his work it is. is now. But on the other hand, I never think there's a purely abstract work, you know, one always seeks out a, that dark blue shape on the left there's something of a bird about yeah, it. And, yeah, yeah, you're, you're very and, right. Uh, and on the left there's a plate of nice poached eggs. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, it's a very impressive work, it works very well here in this it, big it's, it's space. It's quite stunning, it's said to be the um, largest unleaded coloured yes. glass window in the world, in fact. This is really, what is this sculpture here? This is by John Mill, yes. it's a piece called Nathos, which is um, a Greek term for jawbone. It is, well, I can see that, and, I get pointed <laughs> out here. and now we're moving through into a fully lit part of the gallery. Gallery 1 into Gallery 2, which is split level. We've got um, the ceramics collection on the upper level, which is our pieces mainly by Bernard Leach and Hamada. On the lower level of the um, gallery, we've got um, an exhibition, um, Porthmere Beach, A Century of Images, yeah. which looks at the, w the work of a group of artists, 33 in total, who've all used Porthmere Beach as a subject matter over the past 100 years. It's a thematic exhibition. Thematic right? exhibition. By artists who've uh, lived here or just visited here in some cases? Both, really. Both, Both. yes. Yeah. But all devoted to this beach. These are wonderful pots, aren't they? They are beautiful, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Leach, of course, is one of the great glories of the He is, he town. is. Um, I mean, Leach and Hamada, they actually met in Japan in 1919 and then sort of moved to St. Ives a year later to set up the Leach Pottery, which is still in existence now. Yes. I'm really enchanted by this gallery. Of course, the effect of such a, 
wonderful white grey, dark grey type setting is to uh, makes a great difference to the pictures when you think they're probably painted in the chaotic uh, anarchism of the studio. Yes. And they become yes. here. Yes. And I think it's all. Uh, yes, I agree. And I think it's also um, very nice that you can actually see them in natural light in a yes. lot of instances. Oh yes. What a I wonderful natural important. light. Yeah. Yeah. With a great scene. In Sitting in the office now of uh, Michael Tooby, who prefers to be known as Mike. Uh, he is the curator, the first curator, I think. Yes, that's right. Of this wonderful new gallery, custom built. Mm -hmm. So many curators have to face a building built for a very different time and different concept of hanging pictures. This has got all the space and light mm -hmm. and everything. The only thing I, I find is that the pictures are very challenged by the view through the window. The sea is so beautiful and the sound. Mm that it, it, it really throws out down the gauntlet to the art, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <Yeah. laughs> but then that's the uh, uh, appeal of being here, which is that uh, it's a very immediate introduction to that which the artists themselves were confronting. So if there's any place in the world where you can see immediately the challenge laid down by the subject matter that the artists chose to address, then here we are. I always wonder if it's that challenge that uh, made so many of them abstract artists that it's impossible to be, or figurative, almost impossible, in the face of uh, nature's great original. <laughs> well, that is a very interesting point because obviously the key issue for many of our visitors is why does so much of the work, as it were, depart from an academic notion of depicting the landscape? But that's a difficult concept to get across to the non-interested or non-specialised public, mm. isn't it? Yeah, you sure. get a lot of people saying, well, I don't understand What's it. What's all this about? Mm. Well, we do, but surprisingly fewer than one would imagine. Well, these days, yes, I suppose. Yes. But we try and put layers of uh, activity together so that we have a kind of daily free introductory guided tour through to conferences on feminism and Barbara Hepworth and Willie Barnes Graham and their relationship to modernist artists. So we try and layer the activity that we do for the different levels of interest. But the, your general briefing, I imagine, is that the art should in some way connect with the place, isn't it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, for example, we're very different to Tate Gallery Liverpool in that way. Yes, well, Liverpool has shifting exhibitions and things yeah, coming from the right. Tate in, in London. And here it's, it's all St Ives orientated, I suppose. Mm, mm. But then on the other hand, you've almost got an embarrassment of riches because there are so many mm. artists, mm. Uh, even Gabo and Pevsner, mm. and, uh, mm. and of course Ben Nicholson, and probably the most famous of all, apart from Alfred Wallace, mm. who would have been truly surprised to find himself in here, I think, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> that little cottage down the road, and here he is in this well, great gleaming modern building. One thing I was wondering, I mean, we now have, as you might say, uh, the old masters of modernism hanging on the walls here, of St Ives modernism going back to the 30s. Mm. But so what of uh, contemporary artists? I mean, they're pretty thick on the ground here. Do you hold a sort of annual show to get the temperature of uh, modern, art, modern, modern art in, mm. in this place? Uh, well, we don't. We thought about this very carefully. And um, what we feel is that the Tate has to sit alongside all the other activity that goes on in this area. So there's the marvellous Newlin Art Gallery over on the other side of the peninsula. There's the Penwith Society here in the town. There's a whole range of small galleries that show a variety of work. There's Penley House that shows the Newlin School. And we try and find a, a niche in which we can complement some of the other work that's happening. So may I say that the artists are tremendously supportive of this gallery. Yes. Absolutely tremendous. Well they should be because it stimulates interest in the visual arts from which they earn their living. Yeah.
And now I'm going to talk to a lady called Janet Axton about the uh, new Tate Gallery, the Tate Gallery in St. Ives in uh, general. And also, of course, she's written a, a beautifully illustrated and very glamorous looking book called uh, Gasworks to Gallery about how it came to be built. Almost a miracle, I would have thought, in these days of constricted funds and people being rather tight about money for obvious reasons. Uh, you explain it all in the book, Janet, but it must have been a, a really taking on a, a, something tremendous, a tremendous uh, difficult task ahead of you. How did it all come about? Well, it came about in two stages. It came about um, with the County Council, whose project it was, because Alan Bowness, who was then director of the Tate Gallery in 1986, said to the County Council, um, if you can provide a building, um, we, the, t the Tate Gallery trustees, will loan the works of art that were made in St Ives between about 1935 and 1975 and let them be shown in the town that they were created. Because you have to remember um, that at that time, if you wanted to see a Ben Nicholson painting in St Ives, it was completely impossible. Only, you could only see Barbara Hepworth because we have the Barbara Hepworth Museum, which had been there for some years. And to the County Council's credit, um, they decided that that was a project they would like to work on because they realised how good it was going to be for the local economy and how it would boost what they called cultural tourism. Yes, it wasn't total altruism because this is, of course, a town depending very much on tourism and also on rather informed tourism and uh, a gallery where you could see all the artists, important British artists who worked here over the years, would be a very strong attraction. But even so, I mean, there were endless hurdles and difficulties, I should have thought, getting the money together. Well, there was, um, but it was, the whole project was spearheaded by a marvellous man called Sir Richard Carew Pole, who chaired a steering group, and he had a lot to do with getting the money together and he immediately got a quarter of a million pounds from the Henry Moore Foundation which really got it on its way and the reason that we were involved in St Ives was that he came down to see us one day at the end of 1989 and said I'd like to get a group of people together to talk about a new gallery could we have your backing and your support and do you think you could help us raise some money and such was his marvellous character that a whole group of people got together and said, yes, we'll do it, and we'll try and raise £100,000. And we had no idea how we were going to do it, and none of us had any experience in fundraising. Mm. And I have to say, within two years, we'd got £100,000. It's quite a lot of money, isn't it? Once you realised it was practical, how did you go about uh, deciding what architect and the site and all that? The steering group in... Um, County Hall in Truro um, first of all organised a feasibility study to look for a site and they hired Catherine Heron and Julian Fury to look at three sites um, all of which were owned by the council yes. and when they walked around the town one day Julian Fury saw the old gasworks site right in the middle of Porthmere Beach and he said has anyone looked at this marvellous spot and nobody had because it was owned by British Gas and they decided to add that to the feasibility study and it came out the, the most popular spot and it allowed for a much more exciting building to be built and so they then had a, um, a limited competition to look for an architect and the winner was Eldred Evans and David Shalev who had already designed the Crown Courts in Truro and although they're London based they have a flat in St Ives only a stone's throw from the Tate so they knew exactly the problems of building a gallery on a north facing beach. <laughs> As it was opened by Prince Charles, yes, um, he is on the whole rather tentative, if not aggressive, about modern architecture. What did he think of this? Well, we were very nervous about him coming, actually, and uh, we were very worried that he might say something. He might think he was a gumboil. That's or right. That sort of and so there was a certain amount of nervousness. But I have to say that he liked it and he said very nice things about it, and I think that did a lot of good. Well, it's not only a triumph in itself, but it's a reproach to many other places in yes. this land where the council and so on are very contemptuous of the idea of providing money for the arts, yes. you know, and, uh, and very against art in general. I think it's uh, a remarkable achievement and an encouragement also.
I'm talking to a lady now called Wilhelmina Barnes Graham, who uh, is pretty spry and has been here a long time yes. and is a wonderful artist. Um, I haven't, I don't think, ever seen any of your work before, but I came through earlier and I, it immediately sprang to my eye and I went and looked at it. There's a, there's a beach scene here with water. Uh, the water is uh, rendered just by wavy lines interlocking with each other. Oh, about, uh, when was that done? I think it was done 1985. 85. It's very beautiful. It's the simple lines. And then there's some pictures here of textures, watery, watery, cloudy textures. Very refined again. Yes, and these are my uh, pen and ink line drawings of things of a kind. I was interested in the theme of things of a kind, and I was in paintings using squares and circles and so on. And then I decided to use a very fine pen, and they are like hair, pieces of hair, in yes. a way. You know that they. How long have you? Uh, how long have you been here in Cornwall? Fifty-five years. It does, looks well, almost impossible, it? I may say. <laughs> well, I hope I have another 55 years. 55 years, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and you've been, uh, you've obviously met everybody that's ever worked here. Well, I've been very lucky. I had three great friendships here. Borley Smart, who's ever so kind to me, and found me a studio, and then gave me his main studio when he moved into number five. And then I was uh, a close friend of Ben Nicholson's, who's yes. also very encouraging, and a studio next door to him, and we were great friends. And Bernard Leach, 37 year friendship. Well, that's a pretty distinguished he was my neighbour. Yes, I, I realise now I miss them all three terribly. Well, I'm sure you do. Well, that's how I yes. noticed that. It's one of the things of getting older. You miss people so much. Terribly. When they go. Yes. However. But what a, what a distinguished little panel of friends you had there. I'm very lucky one didn't realise it at the time. No, one Not never does. One no, never does. No. And suddenly people who you just treated as yes. people become history, you know, yes. and everyone treats you with great awe for having known them, don't you find? Can we go and look at a painting of yours I noticed earlier on in an exhibition of pictures entirely inspired by a particular beach? Yes. And it struck me as such a, a, a cheerful and a lively picture, uh, very much to do with, um, with almost the carnival of the seaside. That's right. Yes, it's down here, I think. Yes. Yeah, I can see it now over the balconies, down a flight of steps. Well, the painting is meant to be summer fun and joy, you know, light, which you get this amazing light on the Porthmere beach, and it's kites, and uh, something to do with windbreaks and people behind them. And one day, talking to somebody in front of it, I look to the right where you get this wonderful expanse of sea, and even the sound of it, and a black kite, a huge black kite, like a bird came down and died on the beach. It's and wonderful. And so it was a, another example of nature copying art. It's really absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I loved it. I was attracted by the uh, the, the colours, the, the, the bright, almost primary colours, against that very subtle sand background. Uh, it has something, you know, nothing of the shapes like or anything like that, but it has something of the gaiety of Miro, I think, about That's it. That's right, yes, it is. Um, um, it, the, those windbreaks and the kites, it, it, it's extremely exciting and this year I was away most of the summer but I came back beginning of August there's still a great crowd here and there were new shapes brand new shapes sort of funny shaped tents yes. in two colors or stripes and uh, some with windows even uh, plastic windows that they could see to right or left but wonderful new ideas but unfortunately I, I couldn't attack it and I've been on this beach as I say 55 years and you can't but absorb it balcony with great glass windows overlooking the sea again and uh, people are appearing on the beach now they weren't there when we started flags waving waves breaking very beautiful and big glass panels allowing us to look through that and a tile place here 
And I'm sitting next to a gentleman called Peter Randall Page, who has been commissioned to do a sculpture. How big will the sculpture be? It's about four feet high. Is that including <coughs> the plinth? That's including the plinth, yeah. And it's, uh, it's a very plump figure. It reminds me of that famous uh, Greek Venus, you know, the uh, primitive uh, yes. plump Venus. But it has actually dedicated, or a, a sort of spiritual portrait of someone who's so close to my heart, no one's closer, Bessie Smith, the great blues singer of the 20s. What made you decide to choose Bessie Smith? I don't think she had much connection with knives, did she, as far as I know? <laughs> <laughs> Not as far as I know. Um, I, I love her music. I love blues music, and I listen to a lot of music um, when I'm working and when I'm not working. Um, the process of carving is a very musical sort of process. It's a very rhythmic thing. What's it going to be in? What stone? It's in a piece of marble that was given to me by the trustees of Barbara Hepworth's estate. Ah. Uh, and they, uh, it was a piece of stone that she hadn't used in her lifetime and was left in her studio when she died. Yes. And uh, they very kindly gave it to me and said, would I like to make something? That's wonderful, because they always say the sculpture is already there inside the uh, piece of marble or stone or whatever. Well, there's an infinite number of sculptures within any, any piece of stone, in a way. It's just, uh, you know, you've got to decide which one you're going to make. Mm. And it's, uh, it's definitely a very female... Of course, she was a huge woman. Well, it's not intended to be a, a kind of bodily of portrait of no. her, really. I was listening to a lot of her music when I was making this piece, and um, I really w ended up wanting to make something which was a sort of, um, a, a sort of material equivalent of, of what her voice means to me, so a very subjective yes. idea of... This is strong and snaky. Yep, strong and, uh, and tender as well, yes. very strong and very tender. Very strong, very tender, very tough, yep. very dismissive at times. That's right. Very masochistic at other yep, times. That's You've got right. a lot of, a lot of uh, emotional stuff to draw on there. And here is a, a maquette for it. Is a maquette. Rubber. That's right. Yeah, that was the first little um, wax. Yeah, that was uh, the yes. first little version well, that I made. Well, it's interesting to compare it with the work because it's, uh, it's pretty close. It is, although this thing's only about three inches high. Um, yes. the, the general um, sort of constellation, what it is formally, it's, it's like a continuous coil that loops yes. around the thing. And if you follow the logic of what I've done, it, it, you get back to the beginning again. So it's like a sort of knot, really, yes. in formal terms. It does allude to a figure in a very, very loose way. But, uh, but really, I, I just wanted something which had that feeling of that wonderful, powerful voice that she has. Anyway, it is, of course, fascinating to see how one art can transform itself to another through the brain of someone who's equally obsessed with both. Well, yes, I mean, often when I'm talking about sculpture, I often end up talking about music because the same thing about knowing when something's right, knowing when the shape's right, it's a, it's a bit like that sort of very intangible thing of knowing when a chord sounds right or when a rhythm sounds right. Yes, well, somebody once said of architecture it was frozen music, but they could say it equally of sculpture, couldn't they? They could, yes, and, and of course music's the most wonderfully sort of uh, abstract and ephemeral art form, whereas sculpture is, is really quite the opposite in many ways. But, yes, uh, and song is in between the two. That's right, that's right. Well, a very engaging person here, a full, pretty sardonic sense of humour, called uh, David Kemp. And what he does is he thinks of himself as an archaeologist of modern rubbish. He digs around and moves things together, puts them together in such a way as they become other objects. For instance, there's what looks like a Danish helmet here, only it isn't anything of the sort. It's made from a piece of stamped out industrial detritus. It's, a, it's very powerful, too. There, he's got a petrol tin, right, uh, which has become a totally terrifying primitive mask, and with some old hemp as hair, twisted mouth. How do you go about it, sir? How do you go about it, David? Well, I mean, there's more to Corn uh, Cornwall than fishing boats and uh, fishermen's smocks. Uh, this yes. is a very old place, and people have been coming here for hundreds of thousands, well, 4,000 years since the Bronze Age, and they've been mining. And where I live on the Tinnus Coast is the, the, the history of Cornwall is laid bare. And uh, the, the, the barrows are mixed with the mines and mixed with quite modern pieces of junk like aircraft beacons. I, I, I potter around in this. I'm quite interested in the, the distance of time between the... I mean, it's 6,000 years between the hanging gardens of Babylon and the hanging baskets of Basildon.
Yeah. We're very confident about now. Things have changed very quickly in the last hundred years. Yet we're putting things in the ground that are going to stay toxic for another hundred thousand years. So I'm playing with that time scale and making some bad jokes about the misconceptions we have about the past. And really, the way that we're messing about with the future. And what it seems to me to be doing is to turn unconsidered trifles from the industrial age into uh, fetishes and uh, mysterious spirit-like things, well, which is sometimes are rather frightening, I well, think. Well, it's a matter of archetypes. I mean, look, here's a samurai. Yes. When you look at it, it's a frightening samurai. It's made almost completely out of car parts found yes. down in the mines. There's a dashboard, the gaskets the gearbox cover, the floor mats, this in fact is all car parts. You seem to me to wave some kind of wand over stuff that nobody would look at twice and turn it into, uh, as I say, into tribal fetishes. Well, it's a satire on, you know, on our yeah. faith in our technology, really. But these uh, personages made from spare bits. That's Uncle Sam. He's uh, it's also Uncle made from Sam. computers. He's a credit he man. He's more like the, a fiend to me. There's the cathode queen. Now, these are post-technological um, uh, shaman's outfits, I suppose yes. you might call them. That's Canoe of Long Journeys. Are you interested in, in tribal art at all? Very. Yeah, I, thought yeah, you might I think be, so, yeah. I mean, because it, uh, uh, many of them have the look of tribal art. Well, that's the idea, really. I mean, uh, we've, we're, we're, somebody said we're proud of our museums, which contain a way of life that we've made impossible. Yes. And uh, so museums are absolutely bursting with things which were a vital, integral part of people's lives and beliefs until you know some trick of fate uh, and time left them with us in the museum. And I'm playing that game. It's it's almost circumstantial, the items that I find left. And what I make of them, how I reconstruct them, is similar to the way that we reconstruct and romanticise other societies. And why I've been brought here today is I'm working with Nehi Theatre, it's a local theatre group, uh, that work in the community. And we've just done a, a landscape theatre production this summer in Cornwall about that. I'm the archaeologist. I'm making all these items and they're dramatising it and we go back in time, this pastiche of the heritage industry where everybody has the moral high ground because isn't this terrible, it's in the past, you know. Well, we, we, we take them on a trip into time but unfortunately we slip into the future. There's dire consequences for the time travellers, you know, we end up seriously messing up the future. It's very interesting that you orientate towards the theatre rather than the gallery. The theatre, or in the case of these big pieces, outside these are pieces in, yes. in, in, in the landscape. I think you know, we're going to get certain people coming in an art gallery, people who are interested in art. I'm interested in ideas. I see that, and, but and be aware <laughs> that given time, everything enters the museum. I know, that <laughs> time wounds all heels, as yes, Mato said. sitting next to a person I feel is a new friend, really. Uh, Janet Leach, a very forthright person, wonderfully dressed. She looks like a rather wicked seaman of some sort. But uh, we're here. Uh, she was the, uh, well, she is the widow of Bernard Leach, the great potter. And she was a friend of Barbara Hepworth. And we're now in the, the Barbara Hepworth Memorial Garden Studio and whatnot in St. Ives. I've been before. Wonderful place. How was uh, Barbara Hepworth as a person? Oh, she was very intense as an artist. Very intense. And uh, she was very dedicated and worked terribly hard. Well, I can see she worked hard by looking around me. Oh, yes. I noticed that the larger pieces, which are in the garden, of course, seem to be later. Because that was because, uh, I suppose, it was uh, by that time she was well known enough to buy large pieces of stone yes, and marble yes. and bronze and whatnot. But prior to that, she was doing the very large wood sculpture, which can't be here, which is very well known. Yes. Yeah, and uh, when you look at this place, you can't imagine. You see a small door, and you know the road goes on a very deep slant coming down yes. by that door. I used to come down, she'd call me for help. When they were loading one of these big pieces out of that door, and you imagine a, a, a light with a big base, and when it was sitting downhill, it, its back end was way up in the air. Yes. So then they would have to put the scaffolds, like a T, you know. Yes, to hold it. And every time she'd hear a noise, she'd think something had dropped. So it was my job to reassure her, and we'd have a bit of supper together and all that. But she was getting the stuff out of here was a major problem. 
She was very protective of her work. Oh, yes, They were her children, as it were. Oh, yes, they were babies. Actually, uh, going right through here, from the, the very early pieces like that, rather wonderful small black screaming child in uh, oh, yeah. number one or two, uh, one can see her earlier. But very soon she found her way, didn't she? Well, she was always a carver. She, she was not interested in modeling. And she had the stone and she had the large wood. But it was only later days, after she won the San Paolo. Yes. Uh, which was a major thing for her. Yes, of course. Uh, she got a big lump of money and she was able to do her first huge bronze. And from there on, she went on to bronze. There's quite a bit of bronze in the garden, yes, I see, yes. or things that were not bronze originally, but were then cast yeah, in bronze. Yes, she then cast in bronze, yes. But when you look at how small it is, and you think of the massive work that she did. But I call this place the Citadel. Now, we're sitting here privately. Yes. There are Cornish streets along. Now, if you, you could live here all your life or be born here, you could walk past these streets and never know what was going on up here. You wouldn't. And the garden yeah. itself is absolutely know, extraordinary. She Did she make garden. that? Yes. And she loved her privacy, you see. Mm. Because the, the pieces in the garden, I think it somehow adds another dimension oh, to yeah. them, is the she... texture and uh, of the leaves well, and everything. Well, she sized them that way, yes. Of course, her great rival, I suppose, in a way, and the occasional simil similarities in the uh, actual vision is Henry Moore. Uh, I shouldn't think they loved each other too much, did they? Well, I think they'd been friends in the originally, but I would prefer to do an interview with Barbara without bringing Henry into it. It's a shame that these two major sculptors lived in the same lifestyle. Lifetime, I mean. Yes. And uh, no one ever reviews Barbara without giving half the space to Henry. So uh, I never knew Henry, but I knew his work, of course. Yes. Yeah. But I think that she, probably due to circumstance, no, probably due to her character, which seems to be very determined and very oh, pure, and dedicated. Very pure, yes, uh, no I, compromise. I feel that uh, Henry Moore, towards the end of his life, became actually enamoured of these huge pieces made from tiny little sketches, and uh, that this is a much purer vision than his became. Oh yes, because he always worked directly on the final piece. She never delegated. She had assistants, but uh, she would come out and draw them blue lines on them and tell them where to take it in or up or off, yes. Well, it's pretty tough work sculpting, yes. uh, not in wax or clay, but uh, directly into the material. And she was rather frail. She was always amazed when people came and thought she'd be a big muscle-bound uh, blockbuster or something. She was quite a frail woman, but she was full of determination. The photographs of her make her look like a kind of elf. Yeah. I always likened her. I thought of her as a motorbike going full speed uphill with nuts and bolts falling everywhere. Yes. But she always got to the top of the hill. She always did. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> you are um, Bernard Leach's widow. Yes. I'm um, number three wife. Number three, eh? Yeah. Oh, number three gosh. wife. Yeah, but also the last one. Yeah, the yes, last one. You hung yeah. on. Good, yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. Now, uh, quite apart from Barbara Hepworth, uh, Bernard Leach is another of the great glories of St. Ives, isn't oh, he? Oh, yes, indeed. I saw some of his pottery today in the taste. Oh. <laughs> Long thing. And you of saw course, a little bit of mine as well. A little bit of uh, yours as well. Glad, Are you yeah. a potter as well? Oh, yes, indeed. Oh, well, indeed. I know very little about pottery. I have several friends who collect it like anything. And uh, were you a potter before you met? Oh, Bernard yes, indeed. Mm. I was a potter before. You were a potter in America, even? Yes, and I went to Japan. Yes. To study with him. I was the first foreigner who went to Japan. Uh, and uh, I'd met Bernard when the three of them, when Bernard and Hamada were on an American tour. And I was corresponding with Bernard, and he made arrangements. Her mom let me yes. in. So um, I stayed in Japan. And uh, the, the, it was uh, the simplicity of, of uh, Japanese perfection. Yes, the directness of materials and all yes. that. It was lovely. It is, yeah. and it's, of course, had an enormous influence. It, yes. Japan is a strange place, its influence on uh, Western art, anyway. It, it influence, always has uh, had, yes. Charles René Mackintosh a lot, uh, among uh, other things. Yeah, uh, well, the whole post impressionists. Yes, uh, uh, yes, the Lautrec and so on. Yeah. Yes, and, and did you find you derived a lot of uh, sustenance from. Uh, oh, tremendous amount there, yeah. Mm. Yeah. And uh, Bernard, too. 
Yes, I'm I mean, sure. one of Bernard's, uh, I mean, um, Bernard wrote a book about techniques in Japan. You see, prior to that, there had been art historians who had written about uh, the good art and so forth, and Losa and people, but nobody had ever written how to do it. They didn't know how to make porcelain or stoneware and so forth. And Bernard wrote this book, which is still, we call it the Potter's Bible. Yes. And uh, it still holds up. Well, I don't think there's a potter alive, really, who has escaped from his influence. No, no. None. Even if they've rebelled against it, it's well, there to rebel they had against Well, they had to rebel as well, yes. <laughs> yes, they do, but I mean, without it, it would have moved. And did you, uh, did you work together in uh, harmony and ease? I don't say we did. I would say as a wife, I had a job to help run the pottery. I was girl Friday in the pottery. And he wanted his meals at a precise time. Yes. But I squeezed in between times. I see. To make my own pots. The loss of so many wives married to great husbands. Exactly, yes. Yeah. I, uh, once they came out of the kill, he never rejected one. No. Uh, if, if he was looking at me while I was throwing it, I tried to get away from him because he would always think how he would do it, and I was doing it differently. Oh, but yeah. uh, Barbara's friendship was a great help. Did you ever discuss her work with her, or did you, was it instinctive for her? It was instinctive. I came here many Saturdays, and when, when she had something new going, then we would, before dinner, walk out through the garden and all of that. Mm. Yeah. But she taught me how to be a professional woman, shall we say. And I didn't have to live through triplets, as she had had to live. <laughs> <laughs> really, it's the, it's the peace of the garden and the certainty of the sculpture against the temporary, but strength of, the, of nature all around it. Well, yes, in this garden, one can well understand a very beautiful poem written by the local poet Bob Devereux. He uh, had avoided the whole Barbara Hepworth question. He could have probably met her, she was still alive, but he didn't. He felt she was too much of a grandee and all that. And he felt, without really looking at it, that her work was too stylized and too definite. And then he came into this garden, and was, it was like a sort of uh, revelation on the, uh, on the road to Damascus or something. He suddenly saw how this work was totally alive and totally personal. And he wrote a beautiful poem about this moment of conversion, and here he is reading it. Her garden, a green cathedral to the god Pan, peopled with strange presences. Primeval stirrings among the palm trees, the cherry blossom seen through a bronze eye of mystery. A great stillness, a great unrest, comfort and question in one enigmatic smile. Sparrow sounds are not just sparrow sounds. Gulls cries more than gulls cries. The church bell, a bronze gong, echoed in every corner. Fan palm woman form, blue cineraria, memory of Mondrian, light of Italy, green of Greece, fan palm, woman form. Mm. 